program signed. Stability, uh, action and impact as well. Um, so declare the meeting open to the public members. Just remind you of your ongoing obligation to declare interest. Switch off mobile and turn down your um, your tablet to uh, silent mode. Uh, apologies. We have a few. Um, is that right? Barry and Cahill. Mm -hmm. Barry and Cahill. And then Sandra is going to be yes. a bit late. Mm -hmm. Okay, members. Uh, item two, chairperson's business. Uh, item two point one. There on page five, members, uh, is a letter from Elgin Energy uh, wanting a meeting with me as chair of the committee uh, about the solar PV project in Kells. Uh, members, I think they intend to meet with all the committee members individually, but I mean, I'm happy to organise a meeting and then in have it open and invite everyone to come. Yeah, that's that would that be better? better? Idea, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So the clap to organise that. Yeah. Okay. Certainly not mine. And then, uh, then item 2.2 .2 is on page 6. Is uh, This is Nelger uh, inviting us to go to the annual conference. So we have the time changed now to the panel at 11.50. So we are going to have our own committee meeting in another room and then go and join them around that time. Um, and then we are going to be in a panel previously when we did that, we had one member from each party to be sitting on the panel rather than all 11 of us. Uh -huh. um, so what do you think, members? Think, do you want that yeah, one, one one from, from each, each home, party? Yeah, yeah. 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 So we're nearer the time, then we can, we can find out who wants to be. A volunteering yeah. column. <laughs> yes. If he's available, if he turns up. Oh, well, there's, got to be, there's got to be some privileges for actually being here. <laughs> and it's going to be in Le Monde, is it? Le Monde, yes. Yes, House Hotel. It's not far from here. Okay. Uh, then item 2.3 on page 8 uh, is an email from Natural World Products uh, seeking a meeting with me as chair of the committee about the recycling industry in Northern Ireland. Again, members, uh, if we organise a meeting and then let members know when we can all meet them in an informal meeting. Yep. Okay. Then uh, item 2.4 on page 9 is a note of the key issues discussed at the Chairperson's Liaison Group meeting uh, on the 14th of April. Um, members, are you content to note? Okay, yep. and then um, another item to mention to you uh, is that uh, the chair, the, the deputy chair, and I uh, have been invited to a dinner organised by the Assembly Community Connect to meet with CEOs uh, from Susu Enterprise and I's uh, membership, and I's membership to discuss areas of mutual interest. The Chair and Deputy Chair of the Finance and Personnel and Social Development Committees have also been invited. Um, the dinner is on Tuesday the 19th of May uh, at 6 p.m. in the Members' Dining Room. Uh, members, are you content for me to attend? Yep. Yes. And yes. I know that Deputy Chair won't be able to attend. So if any other members may like to go you know, instead of the deputy chair? I propose calling me sweet. <laughs> 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 Not more. You, you fancy going and meeting them? You can send an email around. Yeah. Oh, send an email around here at the time, then you can check yep. your diary. Okay. Um, so, uh, minutes then at page 11. Members, are you content to nope, uh, to agree, sorry, to agree the minutes? Yeah. yeah. Uh, item four, matters arising. Uh, members, there is a response from the minister at page three of your tabled papers. 
uh, saying that he plans to allocate 4.2 million of carrier back levy income this year across a wide range of environmental projects and programmes. And there is two million pounds of forecast levy uh, receipt, which still remains to be allocated to three categories of funding. Uh, there's a natural environment fund that replaces the natural heritage uh, fund uh, program. And then a challenge fund, that's the previously we've had that for a while. Uh, he's still keeping the challenge fund and the listed building grants again. It's been ongoing for a while. So uh, he's going to spread that two million uh, round those three uh, streams of funding. Um, the minister has provided a breakdown of how he, intend, uh, how he plans to spend income from the levy uh, for 2015-16. That's at Annex 1 in your paper and uh, oh, in his pack, uh, in, in the documents he sent us. And then draft priorities, eligibility and criteria for the natural environment fund, and that's at Annex 2. There is also a workshop uh, he has organised for uh, today, uh, meeting with uh, the NGOs uh, to look at the criteria and, and the... Um, and, and the, the, the budget. A press release issued by the Minister yesterday is also tabled for your attention, members, um, as is a note from the Minister, that copy tabled, advising that, as there is a planned workshop, he does not feel it appropriate for either himself or officials to brief the committee while the process is life as it may be prejudi prejudicial uh, to the overall approach and outcome. The Minister has promised to continue to engage with the Committee as matters progress and evolve. Now, um, I want to thank the Minister for sending us information, but again, I think it's disappointing. He doesn't want to come and talk to us. I don't think it will be prejudicing the process. I mean that he is meeting the groups today to, to tell them about the criteria. I mean, coming to talk to us and answer questions, and I don't think you know that would in any way arm um, the process with, with his funding. And um, I really have to say, um, there seems to be a reluctance of the minister to come and be engaged uh, with the committee. I mean, I'm I'm on the the L committee. Stephen Farry has been at the committee five times in the six months since I joined the committee. So, I mean, there seems to be a, a reluctance of the minister, I think, wanting to update us on this uh, very important issue. I understand, I mean, he obviously he, he has a very difficult job trying to balance the, the budget, and he did come to the committee uh, when we asked for a special meeting at the end of March, but uh, I just really want to express my, my <coughs> disappointment that maybe you know, there, there seems to be not a lot of willingness to, to want to you know, talk to us on, on the whole process of, of transparency of how the money is going to be, to be uh, allocated. And, and you know, he had made some, I think, different comments to me uh, when, when I heard it in, uh, during question time and reading his press statement in the last couple of weeks, just the figures to me didn't seem to add up. And uh, you know, I would have liked to ask him, you know, when he, if he, he, he would hear that, you know, we could would ask, you know, how the figures add up, Peter. Sure, I mean, yeah. I'd, I'd agree with what you've said. Um, one thing slightly concerns me. I think we maybe need first sense as well to get a bit of feedback off the NGOs. Mm -hmm. uh, because just from a very brief look at that, that press release, um, to my mind, the substance, the headline maybe gives a slightly different impression from what the substance then of the press. The, the, mm -hmm. To read that, you would make it, it make it look like the two million is going straight into the groups that have lost directly the funding, mm -hmm. whereas actually it's a number of different streams to which 
Some may be applicable to them and some may not, and they may be able to bid for that. There may be other groups doing that. And I would be a bit concerned that essentially if there's money that has been is available and we have a situation where a number of those groups are in a level of crisis that is not meeting that crisis in that regard now. Yeah. The, the difficult thing on this is we're trying to judge this a little bit second hand in that regard. So I think mm -hmm. first instance I think we need to get some level of feedback off the NGOs. If there's a workshop today that may start to um, it may be useful to try to see if we can get whatever follow up from from the groups on it. But I also think I mean there is a very significant issue here, um, and I would tend to agree with you in terms of the um, the issues about. I don't think it necessarily prejudices the situation to no. get a generality of the thing. I mean, it's not a question of, and I would hope we wouldn't be doing that. Of you know, why has such and such group not got its hundred thousand pounds that it got last year? It's yeah. it's the wider picture that That's we're right. trying to look from Absolutely. a strategic point of view on yeah. it, but. Yeah. Yeah. I think, as I said, the first instance, probably mm -hmm. need to touch base with the, the NGOs to see after today's bit where they are on that, but and then take it take it from there. Yes, I mean, my my thinking is that really, when there's only two million pounds over the next really from from July on, that's what nine months of the year for a lot of the organisations. You know, why do they have to apply all over again? Why not spread that two million pounds out? Yes, with a reduction of funding to those organisations who are getting the money already until end of June. You know, why do they have to then all of apply it all over again? You know, if if there is yes, still two millions, why not instead of say giving them through a hundred percent, you know, spread out seventy five percent to let people know now, then rather than that. Uncertainties hang over their heads. Chair, I, I, um, I just want to comment on this. Um, yes, it would be desirable to spread in the way that you've mm -hmm. suggested. Mm -hmm. I think that's, that uh, is a, a constructive comment, but um, I suppose there are individual needs from mm -hmm. individual organisations. Some are worse off than others. So um, a judgment call has to be made in relation to them. I agree with Peter. I think that we should hear from stakeholders, um, those who are intimately and um, imminently affected mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. in a negative sense, mm -hmm. uh, and we should try to understand their position. Uh, what I do disagree with is I think the minister is in the middle of a process and that process needs to be completed. He can't come to the committee and say, well, uh, I haven't made my mind up on this and this and this and this. I, I think much better if he comes after this process is completed. Um, and uh, in that sense, uh, I think it would be much more satisfactory for this committee to receive his decisions uh, given the money that he, he has got and the money that he, he uh, feels is in the system. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but uh, it's a matter of judgment. I think that um, uh, we have to be a little bit patient in relation to this and, and see just uh, how it uh, turns out. But I do agree with Peter. I think we should go to stakeholders. Mm -hmm. yeah. Sure. OK. Um, when would do you think it's appropriate to have the NGOs to come, though? I think they may be a bit shy if they want. They are in the process of applying yes. for grants, whether you know they want to come and talk to the committee. Well, Chair, maybe, maybe just a, <coughs> as an initial bit on it. I mean, if, if contact is made, the kind of test the ground is their willingness. Now, they may. You're right. There's a possibility yes. that they may simply turn around and say, yeah. actually, because of the application process. Yes. Or they might, I mean, I suppose, <laughs> in no way being cynical on this, but I suppose it happened in different places yeah. on it. You may get a perception amongst people who are looking funding of, well, if I stick my head above the parapet, I'm critical of the department. Is there going to be a backlash and I'm going to, yeah. going to miss out on funding? Uh -huh. and, you know, I'm not saying that would happen, but that, that's quite often a common perception at times sure. with um, stakeholders who, of whatever government department along the lines of, I'm critical, am I rocking the boat, am I risking my chances on it? But it, probably at least if there was some level of initial informal contact yeah. made yeah. Uh, even as well if, if if there's some information could be could be got back um, obviously the preference would be even just for them to be um, giving evidence but at the very least then for example 
to at least even uh, off the record <coughs> tell from the committee how they're saying things so yeah. that it doesn't yeah. prejudice any yeah. individual obligation. Maybe then we organise something, say next week or next week, or maybe even after after election. Yeah, the week after election yeah, to meet informally the you know groups like uh, As to Wildlife, uh, Northern RSPB. Ireland Environment Link, and RSPB, or those organisations, uh, like last time when we had a meeting with them. So an informal meeting and just to really assess how they feel about the process. Would that be okay, members? We organise something like that, okay. and then in the meantime, then we write back to the minister and ask him when he wants to come, when he think is appropriate for him to come and talk to us about about the process. Yeah. So probably, you know, I think he says in his letter there will be sometime in the middle of June. Uh, that the, the whole assessment will be over and organisations will be told about the outcome. So maybe when that's all done, then he can come and talk to us. OK, members, we organise that then and let you know. Okay. Yeah. Then uh, next item, item 5, page 20, members, it's the taxis. Taxi Meters and Fares Regulation, NI 2015. The purpose of this statutory rule is to introduce a statutory maximum fare tariff, including an unreasonable <coughs> premium for taxis in Northern Ireland, along with a mandatory requirement for the fitment and use of taxi meters <coughs> and printers and receipt printers. Um, the committee considered a synopsis of responses to the consultation at our meeting on the 7th of June 2012, <laughs> some time ago. Uh, the committee first considered this as a one at our meeting on the 16th of January last year, 2014. At that time, the committee deferred consideration due to unresolved issues with other elements of taxi legislation. The department have now put measures in place to resolve these issues, and the SL1 has been resubmitted for consideration. The rule is subject to the negative resolution procedure and is proposed to come into operation on the 28th of September 2015. The Department has advised that the fares, uh, the fare as calculated in 2011 was broadly in line with the current regulated fare for Belfast public hire vehicles, but the calculation is being reviewed at present to take account of the passage of time. The Department will provide additional information within the next month. Members, um, yeah. Here, I, I have re sorry, Peter. Okay. I just uh, I received an email, an enormous anonymous email, or well, was forwarded to me. Um, just worried about uh, the fitting. Is that is that what I, you get be, about well, the fitting of, of of the equipment that it needs to be properly fitted, not with cowboys need to be maybe going to the factory to have it done. I, I would say, I, I mean, mine, I've received an email, now it's not actually anonymous in that regard. So <laughs> yeah, I, I don't it was know forwarded it, to me as anonymous. Well, yes, let me put yes. this way, I suspect it may be similar, but uh, I think in light of that, it may be, so I, I think to be fair, nobody's particularly raised anything as regards to the fares element of things on it, yes. but there does seem to be a number of issues around yes. fitting as to, yes. if you like, whether proper checks are in place and it's been yes. properly fitted, as you say, the cowboy side of it, Yes. The issue, I think, there were supposed to be taxi meter centres where that mm. issue yes. is, yes. and I suppose also it may well be in some issues around cost and the also cost that the department cost may be very low, may not be yes. the I, right well, price. Expect, and, to be fair, chair, then it's probably making the yeah. same sort of points, and also yeah. I think yeah. a little bit on the time scale side of it. Yeah. Chair, I was going to say, I mean, I'm sure maybe you're, you may well have been thinking the same that maybe worthwhile to get the officials in we'll before we take this any further in. or not. Members, would you agree? To... Next week, I then, we'll see if they can come and uh, we can look at this. There's still plenty of time, you know, not until September. OK. So and a number of issues, then, we write to them about it. Um, but it's also, yes, it's about the varying fares mm. as well. Peter, we've probably got the same same thing. It's about the variation of, of fares, maximum fares. So a number of questions we want to 
to ask them on that. Okay. I mean, I want to see, to know, uh, I think previously they said the meters can be adjusted to show different bands of fares. So uh, whether I want to see as a passenger, as a customer, if I get into a taxi, would I see the fares on the meter? Is that the fare I pay? Or is it going to be five pounds and then the tax, uh, taxi driver and say, well, it's only four pounds? You know, kind of, how do they vary the fares? Because they only need, they only need to, um, that's a maximum tariff. Okay, that's maximum they can charge, but they can charge less. So how do we as customers know, um, you know, what is the right fare? You know, so are they going to have it actually showing in the meter the price that we must pay, or is that a price that they can still say, I can give you 10% discount? So, uh, so a number of those issues we want, we want to ask as well. So next item, members, uh, SL1. Item 6 is on page 26, that's the Environmental Liability Prevention and Re Remediation Amendment Regulations. Amen. Uh, the purpose of this rule is to implement the EU Offshore Services Directive to address the prevention and correction of damage in the marine environment. The Department has advised that uh, these requirements must be operational in all member states by the 19th of July 2015. The rule is subject to the negative resolution procedure. The committee considered a synopsis of consultation responses on 23rd of October 2014 and was content at that stage for the Department to prepare the legislation. Uh, are members content for the Department to proceed with making the rule? Or do you feel you want a briefing? Happy to proceed yeah. with making the rule? Yeah. Okay. Seems quite straightforward anyway. Lot Morrow, you look puzzled. You okay? No, well, I'm just just about agreeing, yeah. Okay. Right. <laughs> okay. Uh, item 7 as another SL1 on page 34. The Marine Conservation Fixed Monetary Penalties Order NI 2015. Uh, there's a departmental briefing on page 34, uh, 34 and then the SL1 uh, is at page 36. And if I can welcome uh, Brenda Cunning, Environmental Protection Division and Carol O'Boy. Oh uh, members, Minutes just remind you, Minutes. this is being recorded by the Hansat. So uh, you're, you're very welcome. And uh, if you can give us a briefing, I'm sure members will have questions to ask you afterwards. <laughs> Thank you, you very much. Uh, good morning. Um, my name is Brenda Cunning, and this is my colleague, Carol O'Boyle. Uh, I'd like to give you some background to fixed monetary penalties for MCZs, how they may be applied, and a short overview of the draft order. Then Carol and I will hopefully be able to answer any questions you actually have. Section 13 of the Marine Act, Northern Ireland 2013, enables the Department to designate marine conservation zones mm. in Northern Ireland inshore region as part of a range of measures to protect and manage our seas. Sections 26 and 29 of the Marine Act enable the Department to make bylaws to protect those MCZs these bylaws will be developed for an individual MCZ through a consultation process to assist with the achievement of the MCZ's conservation objectives. They will be used to prohibit or restrict otherwise unregulated activities that may be detrimental to the particular MCZ. For example, to restrict the use of jet skis or to define where leisure craft may anchor. Under the Marine Act, bylaws can also be made to protect marine special areas of conservation and special protection areas, also known as European marine sites. Section 32 of the Act makes it an offence to breach any bylaw made under it. A person found guilty under this section will be liable in summary conviction to a fine of up to £5,000. Section 35 of the Act provides for the use of a civil sanction in the form of a fixed monetary penalty for the breach of a bylaw instead of criminal prosecution. <coughs> and that's where this order comes in. Fixed monetary penalties, or FMPs, are low-level fines that are intended to be used in respect of minor instances of non-compliance. 
proposed penalty amount of £100 for an individual or £200 for others, for example a company, reflects the minor nature of the offences and is in line with similar penalties, for example for littering or a breach of a marine licence condition. You can have a fixed monetary penalty for that. These are civil sanctions, and imposition of such a fine will not result in a criminal record. Civil sanctions enable regulators to take a more flexible and proportionate approach in managing offending behaviour. The use of the FMP is one of a series of actions available to the Department. These range from guidance and information, through the use of FMP for misdemeanours, to criminal proceedings for more serious offences. The Department would always prefer to achieve compliance through information and guidance. However, where that fails and the requirements of an environmental bylaw has been breached, the Department may apply an FMP or take criminal proceedings. In instances where the person who has breached a bylaw is less than 18 years of age, the Department intends to follow the guidance developed for the Clean Neighbourhoods Act. Section 4 of that guidance recommends FMP are only applied in very exceptional circumstances to those younger than 18. Should an activity involve more serious environmental damage or as a repeated offence, the Department may decide to take criminal proceedings against an individual or a business. The process for applying an FMP is set out in the order in Articles 4 to 9. Once an enforcement officer is satisfied that an offence of breaching a bylaw has been committed and having gathered appropriate evidence, the Department may decide to issue a notice of intent to the person involved. Upon issue of this notice, the person has 28 days within which to accept the fixed monetary penalty or to make representations or objections to the Department. If the penalty is accepted, the liability is discharged by paying 50% of the fixed penalty within this 28 days. Where a person has not accepted the penalty within 28 days, the Department will consider any representations or objections that have been made and decide whether to issue a final notice. The Department also has the option of not issuing the penalty. For example, they've received new information that defends the person for the action they've taken or to initiate, initiate criminal proceedings instead if the case was more serious than previously thought. If the Department issues a final notice, the person has 28 days to either pay the penalty, less a 50% discount if they've previously made representations, or to appeal to the Water Appeals Commission. In cases where no appeal is made, the person must pay the penalty within 28 days of, or face a late payment penalty of 50%. Likewise, following an unsuccessful appeal, person has 28 days to make a payment or they may occur this 50% penalty. Any unpaid penalties can be recovered by the Department as a civil debt. For those sanctions make an appeal to the Water Appeals Commission within 28 days of the final notice, they must identify the grounds on which they're making the appeal. The draft order provides these and it provides that the appeal must be made in writing, that certain documentation must be provided by the appellant and that any appeal will be determined in accordance with the Water and Sewage Services Order, Northern Ireland 2006. The Marine Act requires the Department to consult on and publish guidance on the use of fixed monetary penalties, and this is carried through into the draft order, before they can be used, and requires the Department to have regard to that, that guidance in exercising its functions. We intend to carry out consultation on the draft guidance once the order has been affirmed in the Assembly. The Marine Act also requires us to publish a report from time to time of the enforcement action that has been completed by the Department, and the intention is to have an annual report published on the Department's website. You will be aware that the Department consulted on the draft order last year. Thirteen responses were received, nine of which were substantive. Those were broadly in favour of an FMP system. Some consultees wanted to see higher penalties, however, we are content that these will be a deterrent for low-level offences. This was considered during the development of the Marine Act itself, which sets an upper limit of £200 for an FMP. Thank you, Brenda. And I just want to welcome uh, the school uh, pupils, uh, students from Thornhill College from Derry. You're very, very welcome here. Uh, we are just looking at secondary legislation at the moment uh, in relation to uh, the Marine Act and Marine Conservation Zones, uh, so it's about penalties. Um, so, yep, you, you, uh, you, you're politics students, is that right? Very good. I'm surely interested in this piece of legislation. Okay. Uh, Brenda, thank you very much uh, for your presentation. Brenda, when you say minor uh, offences for the FMP, you also cited the example of litter. Yes. 
but litter is covered by another piece of legislation, clean neighbourhood. So are they going to get double whammy? Or? No, sorry. It's, it's more just to say that the level of the fine is in line with that provided by the Clean Neighbourhoods Act. So a, a penalty for littering is £85. Our penalty is £100, or 50% if they get the discount for paying early. So it's just to show it's the same kind of level of a, of a fine, basically, for the same kind of offence. OK. But they wouldn't be done by <laughs> both acts? No. Yes. no. OK. It, it's the difficulty is really spotting it and you know enforcing uh, enforcement. I think the 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 really way to do it is really public awareness, raising public awareness, education. So, are you going to do that? Yeah, it, it's very much so that we'd rather have information um, for the public, both so that they know what the bylaws are, what the conservation objectives are, and also so that they can let us know if they think there is any breaches of those bylaws. <coughs> We're doing that through education with our, our ranger programme, for example. So the Strangford Ranger and the North Coast Ranger, that's primarily how we go out and about, talk to schools, talk to businesses, talk to yacht clubs, um, so that people are aware of, of what's going on. Also, whenever the bylaws themselves are being developed for the MCZ, that's all through a consultation process so that people have buy-in to them and know what they're about and what we're trying to achieve. Yes. And would you be working with local councils as well? Absolutely, yes. yes. Okay. Thank you. Lord Morrow? Thank you, Chair. Um, you talk about the, the, the penalties, and I think you said that some were concerned about the level of the penalty. Mm -hmm. Is that because... It's highly unlikely they're enforceable, or they won't be enforced. No, it was, people were worried in case the penalty was too lenient, yeah. that it wouldn't be a deterrent. Um, I think people were worried in case it was a very serious uh, breach of a bylaw, but in such a case, we would probably go for prosecution instead, which obviously carries a fine of up to five hundred or five thousand pound. Or you could even go further than that. If they'd really damaged an MCZ, you take prosecution for damaging an MCZ with a fine of up to £50,000. So this is really to slot in a lower level deterrent um, for certain types of activities, like um, anchoring somewhere where you shouldn't do. So you're not really causing an awful lot of environmental damage, but you're still breaching a bylaw, and we'd like people not to do that. Yeah, thank you. Jared, I'll just say, I mean, you talked then about... Um, a fine of up to £50,000. It is very difficult to see what the circumstances would be where that sort of a fine was imposed. I suspect, and you can correct me, <coughs> if it has ever happened. I wouldn't be aware of that. And obviously, such a case would be for the courts to decide a this level of fine. Sure. Yeah, and, and that's not something we have control over. All we can do is set it in the legislation that a fine of up to that amount can be applied but it's up to the courts to decide what fines they actually apply. And you don't think that the smaller fine that would be used as a convenient tool to tick another box and say, well, there were so many fines, but really, in real terms, there was no impact? Well, we would like to think that this will have an impact, actually. Um, I've used the example of littering. Now, littering is, is a scourge across the whole of Northern Ireland, and fines are being used more and more. But at the same time, it's not, you can't use that by yourself. You have to use the education and awareness. Yeah. Um, and it's the same for bylaws, that it's just one component that we want to use. They won't wipe out everything that people are doing wrong, necessarily. But at the same time, it's just one component of what we want to achieve. Yeah. Suppose with a huge fine could be fishing issues, when they're not allowed to be fish, fishing there, that if they wander into certain you know, no uh, exclusion zones. Now, yeah. would that be something like that? Well, that would be more a case of that's a regulated activity okay. by, by fishing licences or, or the fishing uh, CFP. Um, so it wouldn't necessarily be something that a bylaw would be applied to. A bylaw, as we said, is more for recreational activities okay. or um, it could be for some types of, of angling or whatever, but it's not really going to be applied to <coughs> activities that are regulated through another regime, wouldn't not necessarily have a bylaw applied to it. Okay. They would be taken forward through their own enforcement sure. process. Sure. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, no more questions for you? Uh, yeah. No. Uh, thank you very much thank for you. coming. Thank you. Uh, members, are you content then for the department to proceed with making the route? Content. Content. Thank you. Uh, members, then, the next two briefings are on the taxi accessibility regulations. Uh,
uh, NI 2015. We were briefed by officials on the proposed legislation at our meeting on the 19th of March 2015, and we agreed uh, to defer consideration until we had taken evidence from Disability Action and IMTAC uh, members. Now, we're going to have a, a briefing uh, from Disability Action. Um, and we're just passing around um, their briefing paper for you, uh, members. Okay, and uh, it will be Monica Wilson, the Chief Executive, and uh, Ola McCann, uh, the Access Manager from Disability Action, who are coming uh, to brief us. Are we running a bit early? They, they are not here No, yet? they are here, yes. They are here, yeah, okay. Yes. okay. Hello, Ola. Morning. Hello, Monica. Very pleased to see you both again. Okay. Um, you comfortable? You. Are you all right? Um, thank you. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. You're nice and tan. You've been away. Uh, no, Carrick Fergus. <laughs> <laughs> as I'm, good I'm as anywhere. <laughs> so uh, it's got its advantages. <coughs> uh, and as part of being part time, um, I won't be saying much, at least until the questions. Uh, Orla is our uh, access manager. Uh, and we had, uh, I had uh, four strokes, so I'm, uh, I'm not as, uh, I'm as compass mentis, but I'm not as talkative as I used to be. Um, so I'll let Orla uh, take the lead. Yes, Orla, if you can proceed, and then members can ask you questions after that. Thank you, Chair. I've switched on, yeah. Um, I'll skip with the introductions then, seeing as Monica has done that. Um, but in order to set some context for you, um, I wanted to give you some statistical information um, in relation to the prevalence of disability in Northern Ireland. And so I'll just run through those quickly. Over a quarter of all families in Northern Ireland is affected by disability, and two in every household, that's 40%, have one or more adults <coughs> living with a disability. Um, the Northern Ireland Statistic and Research Agency estimated that there are 35,000 permanent um, or full-time wheelchair users in Northern Ireland. 35,127 have other mobility impairments. This um, number doesn't include those um, who potentially purchase their wheelchairs privately, um, which is a more difficult statistic to, to establish. Many people who have disabilities are affected by multiple disabilities. 96% of adults with a disability experience more than one form of disability, and over 5% experience five or more. A notable number of children also live with two or more disabilities, and that's estimated at a 4%. An interesting statistic um, estimated that 93% of wheelchair users do not live in a residential or nursing care context. That's the fashion in which the statistic was actually gathered. Um, therefore, these individuals will have accessibility needs in the built environment, in streetscapes and in transport, um, the, the matter of, of pertinence today. The issues which are brought to Disability Action's attention in respect of accessible taxi services principally relate to private hire services in respect of the availability of accessible vehicles, um, the reduced availability of accessible vehicles at certain times of the day, notably at school drop-off and pick-up times, the ability to pre-book accessible vehicles and to book for a return journey, and um, to charging um, where a standard charge of £8.50 is frequently applied to an accessible vehicle. Um, this uh, should be noted against the public hire standard of £3. The Department has said that they will put a stop to the practice of charging a <coughs> higher standard fee for the use of accessible vehicles, but this has not happened yet. Disability Action is aware that public hire taxis have successfully operated accessible taxi services for many years. Disabled users of these services have built up a trust with these drivers who operate as sole operators and are likely to be adversely affected by the proposed accessibility regulations. The Department's failure 
to provide up-to-date information about the proposals has given rise to a considerable amount of misinformation and speculation about the proposed um, regulations and their potential impact on the current providers of accessible taxi services. Some of that speculation is that um, some of the different models of existing accessible taxis, and in particular what I call the London-style black taxi, um, will not meet the specification and that older models cannot be modified to do so. Whilst these current providers are to be afforded grandfather rights for a period of five years, this will potentially put many of the current sole providers out of business as they cannot afford to purchase new vehicles and there will be limited supply in the second-hand market of vehicles which will meet the accessibility specification. Therefore, we fear ultimately reducing the numbers of accessible taxis in service. Um, we have been told that the period of five years, Grace, is not enough time for a sole provider to recoup the costs and build reserves to reinvest in a new vehicle, which will penalise those who have recently invested in vehicles which meet the current accessibility regulations, but which will no longer be able to operate as wheelchair accessible vehicles after five years. Seven years was suggested in the original consultation as a more appropriate time. There are concerns about the availability for purchase of these vehicles which will meet the new specification in Northern Ireland and as a result the cost of these vehicles which may result in operators choosing to proceed with a saloon style vehicle and providing non-wheelchair accessible services which will be allowed. The proposed specification and the supplementary research reports focus principally on public hire services and taxi ranks, which are Belfast focused. There is no incentive to provide accessible taxi services in rural areas, and Report 3 admits that the proposed approach will not address the current le low levels of wheelchair accessible taxi supply in these areas and is therefore unlikely to benefit disabled people who live in or visit rural areas. Report 3 also stated that almost 70% of accessible taxi journeys are pre-booked by telephone, yet the regulations focus on taxi ranks. Furthermore, the lack of accessibility at taxi ranks in terms of location, signage and detailed design, such as drop curbs, have not been addressed. It is important that the accessibility regulations for taxi vehicles take account of the needs of all disabled users, in particular the needs of those who use assistance dogs, blindness partially sighted people and those with communication needs. In addition to guide dogs in Northern Ireland, assistance dogs also support people with other disabilities, such as hearing dogs, autism assistance dogs and medical alert service and companion dogs. These are highly trained and managed animals, and it is not appropriate that the owners should face soiling charges in using taxis. Not all wheelchair users are the same, and individuals have their own preferences and methods for manoeuvring their chair. An individual's upper arm strength will differ, <coughs> and some people who experience balance problems will be affected by head height restrictions and the incline of a ramp. There are also many different types and sizes of wheelchair, dependent mm. upon the user's needs and requirements. For example, a wheelchair to be used outdoors will be heavier. Some wheelchairs will be much wider than others, and notably sports-style wheelchairs. And others will have a longer wheelbase or will include elevated footrests, which present a larger spatial requirement. Some of the detail of the proposed wheelchair accessibility specification is cause for concern. Notably, the boarding ramp width, which should closely match the door width. The suggested width of 700 millimetres will allow very little spare width capacity for most wheelchairs where the wheel, di wheel distance is 700 millimetres. Dual ramps are also dangerous for wheelchair users. That's the <coughs> separate tracking type. The regulation set a maximum incline for the boarding ramp as resting on a curb height of 125 mil. Whilst we recognise that the regulations need to be measurable, we are concerned that there will not always be a curb 
never mind a curb height of 125 available. Drivers will require more information about the use of boarding ramps, and it would be useful if the regulations could also set a desirable um, rather than a maximum gradient. A door width of 750 millimetres is suggested. Most vehicles will actually have a wider clear opening than this, but to set the minimum at such a narrow clearance will make it difficult for those who have wider wheelchairs. In buildings, the clear space recommendation is 800 millimetres. The head height clearance of the door is set at 1,235 millimetres. This is also restrictive, given that the seated position, in other words, the height of, most wheel, of the seat in most wheelchairs, is approximately 450 millimetres from the floor, and allowing approximately 800 millimetres from seat to the top of the head. Many people cannot bend forward to allow for the head height clearance, noting also that the wheelchair user at the point of entry is also moving off an incline when boarding using a boarding ramp. The regulations require the provision of an intercom and loop system where there is a partition between driver and passenger, but do not clarify the requirement for communication aids where there is no partition. The step tread dimensions may necessitate that the tread goes under the vehicle floor, and we have concerns that this may present a tripping hazard on entry to the vehicle. Rear loading vehicles are not so suitable for use at taxi ranks, where the required clear space behind the vehicle for loading and unloading would necessitate that the vehicle stops on the carriageway, which is a health and safety risk. Whilst many wheelchair users would prefer to travel facing the front of the vehicle, we are concerned about the insurance implications for those whose wheelchair dimension will not allow for carriage in any other than a side-facing fashion, i.e. those with larger wheelchairs, um, longer wheelbase or elevated footrests. Uh, we feel this should be taken into account in the wording of the regulations. Training and disability equality will be essential to ensure equitable ser service delivery standards for passengers with a range of disabilities and noting that some people experience multiple disabilities. This needs to include the booking and hailing of taxis, taxi rank delivery, onboard safety, charging and transparency of charging, communication, comfort and assistance. We thank you for the opportunity to come to speak to the committee this morning and we would be happy to address any questions or comments um, which members may have to make. Thank you very much, Charlotte. Certainly you raise a lot of concerns. Have you been engaged with the department <coughs> to you know, express your, your members' concerns about you know the, the regulations and, and the re report? Uh, we um, met with the department a few weeks ago. Yeah, four weeks. Um, a few weeks mm. ago, and um, we did meet with the consultants in the early stages um, in advance of the reports. Yes, I mean you, you certainly mentioned lots of technical issues that really they they need to to bear in mind, and if that's going to you know improve surfaces or. or in many ways, what you're saying is it's actually going to, first of all, maybe um, lessen the number of, of vehicles accessible to uh, disabled people. It is a genuine concern. Whilst obviously Disability Action, which is the push and strive for improved accessibility mm -hmm. services um, in taxis across Northern Ireland, and I think that's one of the important issues to remember, is what impact this is actually going to have beyond Belfast and to the provision of accessible taxi services in rural areas. Um, because um, there is the potential um, to continue with a saloon-style vehicle and to operate as a non-wheelchair accessible taxi, we feel that without the incentive in rural areas and the focus on Belfast um, you know, sort of may actually have the opposite impact to what the regulations are actually intended to do, and that is to make it very difficult to achieve wheel the wheelchair accessibility standard, um, very expensive to do so, and potentially off-putting um, for sole providers um, in particular, um, where there's no financial assistance available. Um, to them in order to, to <coughs> purchase new yeah. vehicles yeah. which are up to standard. Yeah. 
sure, it's obviously cheaper for them when they change the car to just buy an ordinary car. Yes, to which, operate. Yeah. yes, and I mean, there is a need um, for the continuation um, of all sorts of taxi services. Um, but what we don't want to see is a situation where it's um, so cumbersome to achieve the accessibility specification. Now, I understand so. for big operators, I think the regulation would say they need to have a certain percentage of disability accessible cars. Is, is that correct? Are you aware of that? But, um, that? It was something which was suggested at the um, stage of consultation, but it's mm. not my understanding that it's actually included in the regulation. Um, now, firms such as that would be subject to the Disability Discrimination Act, um, but um, I yes. think, you know, sort of as we have seen, that has been very slow to have any sort of impact. Yes, unless I think regulations say that they must do that, then it is quite likely. There, there is the potential that operators don't want to spend so much money buying extra, uh, buying cars that you know would, would cost so much more to provide that disability accessible vehicles for the company. It is potential fear. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I bring <coughs> others in, Peter. Yes, thank you, thank you, Chair. Um, yep, I think it's a very useful document because I think particularly, I suppose, where those of us on the committee, I suppose, have. At times, the difficulty on it is you've obviously got the first-hand experience, mm -hmm. and also, I suppose, particularly what will be useful to us in terms of the SL1 side of it, and then the SR is, is the issues around all the specifications side of it, because that's obviously detail. Uh, I would say just before I ask, maybe ask the first question, Chair, maybe useful. Um, Chair, just also said maybe useful. And note one of the issues just obviously been raised, uh, and I know earlier, funny enough, it said it didn't appear to be a great deal on the fares side, but. I suppose if we're having the officials back on the fares and the metering side of it, uh, the specific issue as regards um, you know, what reflection there is on the, the cost side in terms of the fares, but it may be useful to explore with officials there directly. But in turn, just to, I suppose, try and take, and I know there's an awful lot of detail here in terms of just the specification stuff. Um, I suppose, first of all, I'll ask you a question, because obviously some have been involved with them before. What's the position? Is he uh, a concern over? Uh, particularly on the guide dog situation, where it's, it's soiling charges. Uh, um, that's something I must admit I wasn't. That was in one of the reports. I'm not sure which one, but it's in the report uh, saying that that was a, 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 a problem for uh, taxi drivers, but it isn't because they're um, trained not to do that. No, I understand that. I, so that's probably more in a report rather than. Uh, yes, it is. Station. Okay, mm -hmm. that's, that's grand on that particular one. Right. Um, in terms of. I suppose, I think in terms of some of the, uh, I suppose there, in terms of the specification, the boarding ramp you said in relation to the suggested width of 700 uh, millimetres on the boarding ramp, um, and uh, I suppose there's, there's also issues of clarification on that. I suppose if we take the boarding ramp and also the door width areas together, um, where would you see, I mean, if, if you feel that, that those are potentially in both cases too narrow, mm -hmm. and that, I think I'm, if I'm picking you up right, those bits. What do you think would be more appropriate figures than that, or what would be the uh, a sort of a, a scale that, that, if you're saying that 700 is basically the, the same width sometimes as, as the wheelchair bits itself on? I mean, is it 750, is it 800? What would be the, what would be the sort of, or do you have something specific in yeah. mind in terms of the. You do your bit. Um, we were going to bring a template along yeah. <laughs> um, with us so that we could demonstrate actually. Um, Sort of the, the way, but I mean, Monica, I'm sure, won't mind me um, quoting. Um, Monica's chair actually measures just shy of 700 millimetres in width, and I mean, we're talking about a centimetre shy of the 700. Um, I, there, I was going to say, in, in respect of Monica's, oh no, it's that, okay. It's, it's not necessarily the. the doesn't appear it's, to be. Is that, is that the wheelchair? Therefore, yeah. I mean, I, I'm sure you can um, understand yourself. I mean, sort of how that would sort of affect a person's confidence in mm -hmm. getting in and out of a vehicle um, where there is the potential of coming off the ramp. Therefore, you know, what we have suggested is that the, the ramp should more closely marry the width of the door okay. um, so that there isn't you know, sort of, the, the, sort of the, the same kind of 
potential for slippage, I suppose, um, or to, 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 to go off the ramp on entering the vehicle. Um, we also quoted, I mean, it's sort of difficult to um, visualise um, in some instances the, the, the technical specification in respect of a vehicle. It's much easier to do in respect of a building, and that's sort of mm -hmm. you know sort of where my mindset mm -hmm. would come from as well. Um, and so, therefore, we have quoted um, the minimum clear opening in respect of buildings as being 800 millimetres. Now, I do appreciate that it's maybe more difficult to achieve in a vehicle, um, and you know, sort of in terms of widths, that one would want um, grab rails to be within reach for a user as well on entering and exiting the, ve the vehicle. So we just felt, you know, sort of perhaps, um, certainly um, 750 as the, the minimum is likely to be that, you know, sort of which you know, sort of people will sort of look to in a specification. Um, so perhaps, you know, sort of an increase toward the 800. Might be sure of that. Okay. Um, <coughs> I'm then, sure you oh, don't. I'm sure everybody in the committee understands what 50 uh, mils is. So, uh, just this is a technical thing. Could you show people? 50. Yes, please. Is, is That's 50 that. mils. I can get you a tape right. measure. Actually. No, 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 you don't. But you know what I mean. It's it's a very small measure, but it's very important, okay, particularly. I can. I'm just on, sure. it's, it's basically five <coughs> centimetres or, or two five. inches, really. Two inches. Five centimetres. She's got her tape measure, Here sorry. Five centimetres, about 10, 10, yeah. 12 inches. But, but the point is... Oh, no, 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 50, no, five centimetres would be, would be two inches. Two or two and a half. No, no, no. One centimetre is about... It's 25. One, one cent, two one, two sorry, one centimetre is ten centimetres. We've got a tape measure. Yeah, yeah. About, yeah, about 12 inches or so. Right, that's no 50 centimetres. No, 12 inches is about 300 millimetres. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, if inches is 20. Um, 25 mil is, is an inch, roughly. Yes, that's right. I should have said that. <coughs> yeah, 25, 25 mil is an inch. Is an inch. Yeah, an inch, uh -huh. yeah. Okay. But, but the point is... It's, it's good to see we've yeah. adopted the metric system. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I think the point is that uh, certainly it's not a lot. disability action is, is concerned that people who are uh, significant uh, wheelchair users in... in uh, Respect of their um, of their need. Serious? No. What's the word? Sorry. This is why I'm not speaking. Um, You're okay. People who have more serious disabilities. Um, more profound. Will use uh, bigger wheelchairs. Okay. Yeah. Um, so we're getting um, the London Taxi WX4 specification. Um, it has. Well, it suggests a maximum door width of 880 millimetres, so 800. Uh, is that a maximum, sorry? Or? Uh -huh. Yeah, okay, 880. Okay. Now, um, presumably that is to allow for um, sort of grabbing the wheel or the, the, the grab, grab rails. Um, but so an 800 millimetre. The majority of, of vehicles are actually going to be wider than to that anyway, so 800 millimetres we suggest would allow for um, just as a, the, the, the wider mm -hmm. sure, really, mm -hmm. as a minimum. Mm -hmm. Next mm -hmm. item, I appreciate Joe's a lot of questions sure. here because uh, there's a lot of detail and mm, yes, very, yes. very useful detailed submission. Yeah, yeah. In terms of the boarding ramp uh, and mentioned about the, the curb height and the incline, I wonder if you just talk us through what you think should be there in terms of, in terms of that issue because I know you've mentioned about about the desirable gradient and about the, the problems that if you're talking about a 125 millimetre curb height that may or may not be there depending on I mean, what in um, terms of from that from the boarding ramp side of it in terms of incline what what do you feel should be reflected in there? Um, the suggested incline um, is off the top of my head 16 degrees yeah. does that um, correct it was 13 degrees now, I think, changed to 16 degrees. Yes, I think it's right? 16 yeah. degrees. Yeah. Um, the, the issue, I mean, that is sort of reason, it's really quite steep, you know, sort of it works out at about maybe one in four. Mm. Um, 
but taking into account that what we're talking about is access into a vehicle and not into a building, um, one has to understand that um, sort of the achievable gradient um, will not be the same. Um, but the availability of a curb of 125 um, would not be in particularly in rural areas mm. uh, it would not be available but it will not always be available um, in sort of most townscapes um, even in and around Belfast 125 is sort of slightly higher than the standard curb okay next issue was uh, I mean one issue was which is the the training issue is one that wouldn't be directly in legislation but I think it's one of the things I think we would need to press officials on in terms of that but those are two other issues or Sorry, three other just which just want to touch on. But, uh, in terms of the, you've mentioned again, concern that the head height clearance isn't generous enough, and it would lead to maybe, uh, maybe particularly taller people maybe having to sort of lean forward whenever that's not particularly. <coughs> again, if you're suggesting that perhaps one, two, three, five millimetres is, is, is restrictive, what would you see as being sort of a uh, a more sort of plausible or liable sort of figure? Well, taking in the calculate or taking into account the calculations which we've included in the evidence, um, that is 1250. So you can see that 1235 um, is going to be difficult. And um, an 800 millimetres from the top of a seat to the top of somebody's head is not an overly a tall person. Um, so to just sort of perhaps an increase toward the 1300 um, would be a more appropriate. Um, the internal car dimension, um, I believe, again, off the top of my head, is about 1350 or perhaps slightly higher um, in terms of the clear head restriction inside the vehicle. Um, so, certainly, uh, an increase to 1300. I suppose the two other issues just to touch on then. Um, one, maybe if you talk to you, I don't entirely understand what's, what the position is. Uh, you talk about this, the step tread dimensions and concerns over those from the vehicle floor. Maybe you just talk to you, what, what is the concern there? What's, if you maybe explain that, that issue. Um, this is a concern which has been brought to our attention, which is that um, in order to achieve the step tread dimensions um, in respect of a permanent step, um, that part of that step will have to actually go under the floor of the vehicle. Uh, that creates a step profile where someone on entering the vehicle in particular could potentially catch the toe of their shoe mm. um, and fall um, into the vehicle. So it's not so much an issue in terms of wheelchair accessibility, it's more for other people um, boarding um, the vehicle. So the concern is about trapping. And then finally, in terms of, you've obviously expressed concern over uh, rear loading, and I suppose particularly then concerns in terms of probably more of a, a safety dimension than an accessibility uh, side of it. Uh, again, what are you suggesting in terms of the the issue of re are you suggesting that there shouldn't be any rear loading at all, or what, where, what's your position just in there? The rear loading is something which will work um, sort of at somebody's residence and their place of work, or well, so long as their place of work is not on a main street. Um, but in a taxi rank situation where potentially the ramp is coming out onto the carriageway. Um, it presents difficulty. So it's not to say that rear loading vehicles do not work at all. And you know, sort of it's not to say that rear loading vehicles necessarily operate with a ramp either. They, you know, sort of, there's many, many tail lift um, vehicles available. So it's not to say that rear loading should not be um, a solution, but that, that um, the regulations the should yeah. allow for um, side loading vehicles at a taxi rank. Yeah, um, it's, it's sort of how, how it's come with a taxi rank situation is what yes, really is. Yes, there. yes. It's about, um, well, on public streets, really, um, 
rather than you know sort of in an off street situation, and I appreciate it if it's somebody, park or if, whatever if you're like that. Into somebody's driveway and saying there isn't really any particular problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But in sort of urban areas, um, and you know, a lot of the specification within the regulations, you know, sort of deals with the situation from a rank. Um, and you know, so there would be particular difficulties at a rank or on any sort of main street or public street um, where one is you know, sort of getting into or out of the vehicle um, on a carriageway into the line of mm. passing traffic. Mm. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Thank you. Um, certainly, a, a lot of you know f uh, uh, technical details that I think the department need to look at. Maybe it's hard for you uh, to say, but if they go with your recommendations of you know, increasing roof height and, and all that, would that be a lot more expensive to produce a car? Or is that just a little bit of extra? Or is it going to be massively more expensive? I'm sorry, Chair, I don't have the yes. answer to that. No. No, that's yeah. something that we yes. could seek information for. Um, but you know, sort of, um, obviously, we would be reliant on trying to, to get that information from yeah. um, the taxi vehicle manufacturers or those who put into place you know, sort of the, the adjustments that are required for accessibility. So I, just, I don't have the answer. No, no, no. But then if we are going for new legislation, we need to have most kind of updated, I think, statistics from users, from yourself, what's best for them, what's, what's usable, what's, what's you know, uh, uh, really uh, best, really, for them to use, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Um, I have a lot more. Yeah, thank you for your presence. In, in your paper here, you, you speak about uh, insurance. You have a concern, I think. Uh, you're telling us that uh, this, that the passenger may only be able to be facing in one direction and this may have Im insurance implications. Can you tell us a wee bit about that? Um, the concern would be that, um, well, I suppose we need to set the preference in the first instance. I mean, um, the majority of passengers would prefer to face front or indeed back um, when travelling in a taxi. Um, <coughs> however, the wording of the regulation, our concern is that if the regulation sets that out um, as being an absolute requirement and there is a circumstance which there will be um, of individuals for whom that is not possible but who still require to travel in a taxi. So it would be, sort of, it, it would be the exception um, rather than the rule. But that if the wording of the regulations is such that um, it you know, can be seen to prevent um, or to sort of suggest that that is not an appropriate um, means of travelling, that it could actually then present insurance difficulties for that individual disabled person um, travelling, sitting sidewards, um, you know, sort of, and, you know, sort of indeed for the driver of the vehicle as well. But are you so it's, it's a matter of, you know, sort of careful wording, really. Um, now, it's my understanding um, that sort of the, the, the wording of the legislation you know, can, uh, or will, you know, whilst not suggesting side facing, um, doesn't necessarily not suggest it either. Um, it's all the, the delicacy of wording of these matters, um, which thankfully um, I'm not faced with having to do. Um, so it's, that's, uh, our concern is that it could be used. Um, sort of to but you're not flagging up something here and saying, look, here is a very prevalent issue that needs to be talked through and addressed. And you are saying, I think that there are potentially, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, isolated incidents where this might happen. Unfortunately, or more, more as um, I tried to set out, or we tried to set out in the evidence, um, that kind of dimensional information is not actually truly available in any, any single source. So we can only base our evidence here today on you know, sort of the people who have come forward to us. Um, and we are aware, are aware of people for who, who do require um, to use 
you know, sort of depending on the, the internal dimensions of a taxi, um, would require to would travel sideways. I couldn't, small percentages? I couldn't possibly give you a number on it because um, it's, it's anecdotal evidence um, on our part um, that kind of dimensional information, even in terms of the range of different types of wheelchairs which are currently in use in Northern Ireland, it just doesn't exist. And people do increasingly buy their own wheelchairs, um, so the potential to gather that information or that type, type of data is very restricted as well. Anola, how can the wording be changed then, to accommodate that? It's the verb. <laughs> that's I'm sorry. It's mm -hmm. the verb. Um, that would be one. You know, so we 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 would be willing to look at that with the department yes. in terms of the writing, just to make sure. You know, sort of, and I suppose maybe you know, kind of a, some sort of legal advice in respect of it. Um, that. You know, sort of, uh, whenever it came down to it, yeah. um, one would not find oneself in a situation where the insurance company could query. Um, so, I mean, I'd be happy to sort of mm. to, to work with the departmental representatives to see, and indeed, you know, sort of other colleagues in the disability sector to see if there is a suitable way of wording that. Okay, it's my misunderstanding then. I always thought if you're in a wheelchair, you get into a taxi, you actually go and sit on the seat and you fold up your wheelchair and put it at the back or somewhere. No, some people actually sit in the wheelchair being carried inside a car, so inside the taxi, is that right? Um, yes, um, it's not everybody who would be in a position to transfer out of their wheelchair. Okay. So, in actual fact, I would suggest that you know the the majority of wheelchair users would actually probably remain within their wheelchair in the vehicle, okay. unless that is they were going for a particularly long journey. Okay. Um, also, there in, uh, within the specification, and indeed in the current specification as well, there is there are requirements um, for clamping um, and securing the wheelchair mm. within a vehicle, so mm -hmm. that. Um, Sort of yeah. it, it, yeah. it, it wouldn't move around no. you know, sort of in transit or indeed if you had to stop suddenly. Um, so you know, a lot of people will actually sort of remain in their own chair okay. um, for convenience um, as well as comfort right. when travelling. The wheelchairs are then secured. And it's the, the wheelchair. Tank. Well, the, the individual passenger um, is secured with a separate seat belt um, in the same fashion um, that the, 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 you know, sort of any other no, of the seats. Um, work, but the chair itself is also secured. So what you're saying in terms of insurance difficulties would be insurance company, if in a case of injury, they would say because you're sitting <coughs> sideways. Um, they are, are, well, yes, the, our concern would be that um, whilst we don't think um, sort of it, it's a massive prevalence, but we don't have actual numbers um, of the people who would require to travel sideways. Our concern is that, yes, if the regulations um, have made a point in saying, you know, sort of that side facing, mm -hmm. either even by sort of non, not mentioning at all, um, is not an acceptable way to travel. Okay. And that, you know, sort of those few individuals who did require to travel that way, um, you know, could potentially find themselves in a difficult situation if they, if there was an accident. Okay. Okay. Um, no more questions. Sunny. Um, you want to add anything, Ola? Is that? You okay? Okay, you finished. Um, thank you very much, um, Sonny. As I said, you raise a lot of concerns, and um, you know it is important that we listen to your concerns. You are the users, you are the consumers. You obviously you know best about what you know is most convenient for you to travel in taxis, and and you are big users of taxis and. Yeah. So uh, what we'll do is we are going to talk to the department uh, about uh, the regulation and um, maybe they can come back to you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, members now, um, I understand... Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 
So, uh, but uh, well, just quickly yeah, to say you. that, but when they go, um, the regulation is subject to an EU standstill period, which cannot start until committee agrees the SL1. So, uh, this, if we delay this, uh, this may delay implementation of regulations, which the department hope uh, will be the end of September. But I think we still have time to ask the department to come and talk to us. I, I, I think it's very important, yeah. given the yeah. fact that we'll get it right. Yeah. It's got yeah. right, particularly for yeah. Richard. Sure. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to yeah. say, turn my mic on. Yeah. yeah. I wasn't following uh, their. their Written. I was just listening and I find the technical details quite hard. Remember? Yeah. Okay. Okay, members. Uh, our next briefing uh, is from IMTEC. Um, they have a briefing paper for us uh, on page 59, and the SL1 is at page 61. Members, if you bear with me, I've just lost that. Um, get back to, no, it's okay, I'll get back to my own. Lost the page. <laughs> right, I'll get back to it. Uh, you're very, very welcome. I, we have Michael Lorimer, <coughs> the Executive Secretary of INTAC, uh, June Best, the convener uh, of information and training working group, and uh, Vivian Blakely from IMTEP. You're very welcome. Um, we are obviously looking at the taxi accessibility regulation, and your input to the community will be very, very uh, valuable. We have your written paper uh, members um, had them uh, before the meeting, but if you can proceed and to give us a brief presentation and take questions from members afterwards. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much for the opportunity to come up and, and brief the committee. Before I start on the sort of detail of the briefing paper, it's a little less technical than your previous briefing paper, um, I'm going to ask June and Vivian just to say a few words. Um, June, if you could start. Yes, certainly. Um, uh, Chair, could I ask who's sitting around the table, please, uh, if they could introduce themselves, because I don't know who's here. Yes, of course. Please, thank yes. you very much. I'm Anna Lou. I'm chair of the Environment Committee. And if I can start from my right. Yes, uh, Alban McGuinness. I'm an SDLP member of the committee. Pam Cameron, DUP member of the committee. Peter Weir, uh, DUP member of the committee. Morris Morrow, DUP. Ian McRae, DUP member. Colin Eastwood, SDLP member. Ian Millen, uh, Sinn Féin member. Thank you very much. Well, I'm here today, and as Michael said, it's, it's not a technical um, spiel for me. I'm here as a rural um, resident who is dependent on taxis. Um, I can't access the corridors of public transport unless I have my taxi. Um, and using my other hats, um, I, I volunteer um, for guide dogs. My guide dog, Alex, is under the table. And using my other hats, I'm hearing a lot of people talk about taxis and their experiences of taxis. And obviously, with IMTAC, we have a committee of 18 disabled and older people um, who all use taxis, or the majority use taxis, and we come to a consensus on um, you know, what the regulations should be and how we, um, how we actually um, recommend that things do change, but that there is a scale of change um, to reflect the rural element of this. Um, one of the uh, recommendations, and we were involved right from the word go um, with the ITP, and we welcomed the departments uh, cons having them uh, consult with us. Um, and one of the recommendations there was the equality training, which I think is very, very important for taxi drivers because it is about good customer service and embracing not just the technical aspects, but the personable aspects of dealing with disabled people. So um, that, was, that was very welcome. And that's, that's my, my um, um, position here today, that I'm coming from a very practical, using taxis all the time and have a lot of experience of other people, disabled people, using taxis. Thank you, June. 
Hello, uh, thank you for having us here today. Um, as a person, well, as a, obviously in a wheelchair, as a power chair person, I'm also um, vice chair of the Omnibus Partnership, and quite a lot of our members are in power chairs, and it's vital, the, uh, as June said, the training for taxi drivers towards clamping, putting us in properly, because quite a lot of our members have been injured. And okay. broken bones, I think, are quite serious. So training is vital. Sure. And as Michael will no doubt let you know, we would love to have everything in an ideal world, but this is the best of what we can do without putting people out of business. Mm. Because mm. some of the, the big taxi companies are fine, but even they have fall down with regards to wheelchair taxis. Um, depending on where you live, uh, you can be fine. You go to visit a friend and you're scuttered because you cannot get home unless the one that has taken you brings you back because their local service isn't the same as your local service. So, I mean, this hopefully will make everything across Northern Ireland more or less level playing field. But as I say, we don't want to put anybody out of business because in an ideal world, if you have lots of money, you can certainly go and buy a low four transport which would suit everybody. But no one, I don't think, has that money, not unless you're going to give us some. So therefore, <laughs> I'll leave the rest up to my Okay. okay. Um, again, both June and Vivian come from the perspective of people who use taxis all the time and people who talk to people who use taxis, both wheelchair accessible and, 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 and uh, ordinary saloon vehicles. Um, so in, in terms of MTAC, we have been involved in, as a stakeholder in the reform of taxi regulation for over a decade now in one form or another. And we had a number of key issues uh, that we wanted to achieve from the taxi reform of taxi regulation. Vehicle accessibility was one of them, both from a point of making it easier for wheelchair users and other disabled people to use taxis, but also the safety element. We too have heard the stories uh, and heard the first-hand testimonies of wheelchair users who have been thrown out of their chair because of unsafe uh, carriage in, in vehicles. Um, um, so we, we really want to see the, the, the improved accessibility of, of taxis, uh, the safety of vehicles, and also, crucially, an increasing availability of wheelchair accessible and, and other taxis. <coughs> and again, as June says, particularly outside the Belfast area, though I would say the feedback we get and the research done by ITP points out that availability is also a problem in Belfast. Um, Ideally, as, as, as Vivian says, we promote the idea of inclusive design. We would prefer that all taxis operating were accessible to as many passengers as possible, whether you use a wheelchair user or whether you use a wheelchair or not. Um, but from a pragmatic perspective, we've got to recognise the nature of the taxi trade in Northern Ireland. You know, there's a vast number of <coughs> owner drivers out there, single operators, uh, even within the big firms in Belfast, people operate as self-employed. You know, it, it, it is a very fragile trade. Um, and we also recognise that lots of older people and disabled people do rely on taxis. So we have to have a balance here that is something that the, the trade here can work with, because if we over-regulate, we are actually going to be counterproductive and reduce access to taxis. In the briefing paper I sent you, I sent you a, a, a background in terms of some of the, 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 the policy work that's gone on in taxi accessibility, starting at a European level. There was a project run in the, the late 90s called Taxis for All, saying, can we come up with this ideal design of a taxi? And they came up with this wonderful vehicle that was low floor, step free, wide doors. You could walk into it, any wheel, you know, a variety of wheelchair users in different sizes and shapes could use this vehicle. But the reality was that while well, they developed the prototype, turning that into a reality was going to cost billions and was going to be prohibitively expensive to the taxi industry. So, uh, following on from that, the European Council for Ministers for Transport looked at the issue again, published a report in 2007, Access to Taxis, and really it took a more pragmatic view. How can we improve taxi accessibility across the board, both for wheelchair users and non-wheelchair users? 
and they went, the, what access the taxis actually sets out is a broad range of specifications from an ideal down to a more realistic based on what vehicles were currently available and operating around Europe at the time. Uh, we refer back to the, our own legislation, the Disability Discrimination Act, and under that the government has powers under Part 5 of that to set taxi accessibility regulations. Now, again, going back to the points made before, the big difficulty has been how do we come up with a standard here that, for instance, when we're talking about public transport, there's a reference size wheelchair, uh, reference wheelchair size that's used for buses, trains, etc. But what the work that the European work has done on is you can't even come up with a design that accommodates that, particularly on things like height uh, and width. Um, so the government, basically, the, the Westminster government procrastinated for 10, 15 years on this issue, and eventually in 2009 consulted on what they saw was a draft specification for wheelchair accessibility, um, but basically shied away from regulating and said we will encourage we will use this as a voluntary uh, a, a voluntary specification um, and within that specification they had a, an ideal and a preferred um, from the northern Ireland perspective we very much welcomed the the decision by doe to actually look at evidence on this and appoint itp um, itp had a proven track record in terms of expertise in this area. Um, I think the reports that they produced were excellent. Um, and they came up with recommendations which, again, we could sit here today and say they could have been a lot better from a wheelchair user's point of view. But they were balanced in terms of needing to protect the trade here and not to drive people from the trade. Um, and they also, as, as June has pointed out, they, they, they give equal weight to the idea of, of training as well as, <coughs> as, as physical access to taxis. I say the department then consulted on the accessibility uh, uh, requirements during 2014. We responded to that. I've put links on, on, on the briefing paper to, to our response. Um, and they were, to be honest, they were at the lower end of the, 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 the standard set out in something like access to taxis. They, they pretty much mirrored the DFT, uh, the Department for Transport uh, uh, specification that they had set out in the 2009 papers. But they are a, an improvement on what we have. They are a substantial improvement on what we have. Um, to give you an illustration, uh, I think it's, it's in the ITP report, they talk about and I know in your previous, uh, there was reference made to the current public hire fleet in Belfast. Um, this would mean that some of the older vehicles will not meet this specification going forward. But some of these vehicles are already 15, 20, 25 years old, and things have to move on at some stage. Mm. By the time the grandfather rights expire, some of them will be nearly 30 year old vehicles. And you don't want to be in the London, <laughs> the London taxi firms, or the, the manufacturer of these vehicles, will tell you that accessibility has changed remarkably since then, and they would not view these vehicles as wheelchair accessible. So, um, we think they're realistic. Um, we also recommend the, the department has subsequently taken the decision. Again, part of the reason the focus is on public hire is because they are the only recognised wheelchair accessible vehicles in Northern Ireland. They are the only vehicles tested for wheelchair accessibility. Any other vehicle operating outside of Belfast that says it is wheelchair accessible does not get tested for wheelchair accessibility. So that is why the focus on the reports is on public car taxis in Belfast. But we recognise that the people who have invested in, in, in wheelchair accessible vehicles outside Belfast have made a commitment and we welcome the fact that the department are proposing to extend the grandfather rights now to those vehicles as well. Um, in terms of our concerns, we did raise in our response that ITP had made very important recommendations around handrail provision and lighting and they weren't included in the departments and we asked that they be included. Um, we have bigger strategic concerns, and I think you've heard some of this in, in the previous presentations before. Um, linking the accessibility regulations to ranks, we don't think will work. We think there has to be a link to operator licensing. That again will not work outside of Belfast because the vast majority of 
of operators are small scale single operators. Um, so we need to look at ways of how we increase the availability of wheelchair accessible vehicles outside Belfast. Unfortunately, vehicle accessibility regulations will not do that. They will set a standard for the vehicle, but they won't actually yes. provide the means of, of, of increasing the numbers. And I say, again, ITP and ourselves, we pushed a report in 2008, which recommended that we use a, a number of levers to increase the provision of wheelchair accessible taxis uh, across Northern Ireland. Um, and some of the recommendations we made at that stage, and again, this was in, in anticipation of uh, things progressing 2008 more quickly than they have, um, is that the department looked to provide financial incentives. And we know that they don't have a huge amount of wiggle room. But things like um, uh, reducing fees and things like that for, for, for providers of wheelchair accessible vehicles. Reducing licence fees? Yes. Any sort, of, any sort of lever that the department has to reduce the cost. Now, they will not be huge, and we know that, but any incentive we can give to operators to invest in wheelchair uh, accessible uh, vehicles. Um, Improving taxi infrastructure, making sure that the ranks can be used easily by wheelchair users and by wheelchair user accessible taxis. And again, we produced a paper in 2010, I think, for road service transport NI uh, around how to improve uh, rank accessibility. So that we have issues around curb heights addressed, we have issues around um, turning circles and turning space for wheelchair users addressed, and, and things like that. Um, uh, the big area, though, where we see that there is a, a, a potential to encourage uh, wheelchair accessible uh, taxis, particularly outside Belfast, is involvement in transport services and in public transport policy, particularly in rural areas. Demand responsive transport, we have you know, most people will be aware from rural areas of the rural tra community transport partnerships. Is there ways to, rather than them buying the vehicles themselves, to work with taxi operators and, and link in with taxi operators? Um, the same goes for the, the, the disability action transport services. Why invest in wheelchair accessible taxis? Why not encourage uh, local operators and part and subcontract some of that work out? Um, but and there. There is also the, the procurement of, of taxis by health, education and other government departments. Again, we would be strongly of the opinion that they should adopt the DOE standard as their specification for services in future. Again, the feedback we've had is primarily, and again, given the, the, the current climate and the, the future climate, they are driven by cost rather than quality. But we would strongly urge that, or argue that mm -hmm safety of passengers comes above the cost of, of the service. So there, there is massive opportunities through cross-government work here to actually encourage uh, more operators to go down the wheelchair accessible route. Um, so I say that very much mirrors what ITP, we produced that in 2008, well before ITP produced their report. The final thing that we have is that, yes, the current standards are a step forward. But design and disabled people and wheelchair users are changing, the, the population is changing. We need to build in periodic review of this. We need to, for instance, in five years' time, can we look again at the specification? Can we then look at some of the dimensions? And as vehicle design moves on, as, because the vehicle design will have to adapt to the population, can we look at a periodic review of, of the specifications? Thank you very much, Michael. Certainly, yeah, a lot of very useful information for us to consider. Uh, you probably have heard uh, um, uh, disability action uh, mention a number of concerns about you know, roof height, about width of doors, ramps, <coughs> and, and all that. I mean, it is going to be very difficult for the industry if disability actions suggestion of increasing height, roof height and all those technical dimensions be implemented? Well, again, this is, this is part of the, the dilemma that we face as an organisation of disabled people. We have members who can't use wheelchair accessible taxis because 
of the restrictions in terms of door widths, door heights, particularly door heights. But the difficulty is you have two options if you're going to buy a wheelchair accessible vehicle. You either buy an off-the-shelf model like the London style taxi mm -hmm. or you, 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 you get a, a vehicle conversion done. The problem is that these uh, specifications that ITP have come up with are based on what is commercially available at the minute. The, the, why, the, the more you increase things like door width, door heights, you reduce the number of vehicles available. The other thing that needs to be and pointed the cost out, as well. yes, yeah. The other thing is that nowhere else in the UK do, would you have such onerous uh, vehicle regulations. And really, again, not being a sympathiser for the taxi trade. They would quite rightly turn around to this committee and say, why are we being required to meet much higher standards than anywhere else? And the, the automatic response will be, we simply won't provide the service. Yeah. And we end up in this counter position where we're trying to increase availability in numbers and we end up actually reducing the numbers. Sure, we'll be counterproductive for users. Yeah, and I say it's, it's, a, it's a terrible dilemma for us too, because say we want as many people as possible to be able to access the service. That we're, that's what we do. We promote inclusive design. We want everybody to be able to travel. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Um, I have Peter Wee. Thank you. I suppose just picking up on that point, though, I mean, I'll there was a range of obviously yeah. concerns that were raised about disability action. Uh, from what I heard of them, in most cases, it was a question of saying that what's there is falling a little bit short and will create practical difficulties. Now, I can understand that if you were taking something which was simply going to price everybody out of the market, that would create difficulties. But would you not agree that what Disability Action said were quite reasonable in terms of you know, saying, well, actually, instead of perhaps suggesting a ramp size of 750, it should be closer to the door size of maybe 800, instead of um, the, some of the figures up here, some of the, the elements of uh, suggesting that uh, that on the regulations, the door width is 750. That's a bit narrow, and consequently, mm. somewhere around 800. I mean, those are reasonable suggestions, and if, if we're getting that also directly from the I mean, whereas appreciate you're trying to balance out a certain level of practical. I mean, those are reasonable. That's which should be reasonably accommodated. Would you agree? But the point is, when do you bring it in? Do you say that they have to be now? So for the man that has been making his living and providing but, that transport. Can't do that until he has a. a I think no. Adapter. I think Vivian, that's where presumably the issue of grandfather rights mm. that you're, you're taking about those who would, yeah. you know, would be. I think there's a difference between what people have immediately now, and you don't want to knock people out of the market no. unnecessarily in that, but and what going forward people would want. What, what would potentially be helpful in this is if the department came back and gave you an indication of the number of vehicles that would potentially be taken out of the equation if we increase, say, the ramp width to 800, yes. if they were to increase the, from, from the current one. I mean, from I a think, commercial think point of view, because again, we can't ask operators to go and buy vehicles that aren't commercially available. So mm. it has to be a realistic approach mm. on this. Um, so it might be helpful. And again, I, I, you know, from the, 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 the work that ITP did. The only thing, the only thing Michael, if, if, if presumably quite a lot of the vehicles that are being used for wheelchair access at the moment fit those criteria, that would suggest the vehicles are commercially available. The only issue is whether you narrow the field of the, of the commercially available vehicles, but they are still presumably commercially available in that regard. You, you will have a range of vehicles. You know, one piece of work I did in, a number of years ago with the department was to go down to Dublin and to look at, for instance, the, the, the approach they took in the south and vehicle accessibility. And there is a vast range, you know, between the sort of London-style taxi to the, the, the more European cab. They are more generous, some of the vehicles out yeah. there. But you are then talking about restricting the market down to a select but number the other, of vehicles. The other issue a little bit... Um, what, what would be the difference in cost, for example, to purchase the London style taxi? Well, again, and the you, European you've got to look at the market here. You know, you look mm. at Belfast Public Arts, predominantly a second-hand market, yes. and there's an awful lot of it. You know, I always say that this is where London taxis come to die. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a place where the old, you know, we still have fareway cabs and metro cabs running about Belfast, albeit getting smaller every year. Um, but even the TX1 type London model, which is predominant in Belfast city centre, is 15 plus years old now. So it's, it's, 
you know, I'm, not, I'm not sure some of the folk who are involved in it would necessarily recognise your description of that, but I mean, one of the things... It's but, in the ITP report. I, one I of the, yes, you know, yeah, but that's not necessarily gospel in that regard. But uh, I mean, one of the things, I suppose, at least, which covers the, the, the fit-for-purpose quality to this is as part of the regulations which have already uh, gone through, you would have... Um, once you get past the grandfather rights as well, you would have annual checkups in that regard. So the whole point is that nothing that is not fit for purpose should be on the road. Sort of that in the same way as you would have with, with other vehicles uh, on that basis. <laughs> and the thought occurred to me on that bit. If what, for instance, Disability Action is saying, we need slightly better standards or higher standards than what has been proposed, and a slight degree of adjustment in that regard, which seems to be perhaps not unreasonable. One thing you say, which I think is in and of itself is a reasonable point, but maybe needs to be married in, if you're talking about uh, periodic reviews of the specifications, which everybody can see is sort of a reasonable idea in and of itself, if you set the initial specifications at, at maybe sort of at what currently maybe a slightly lower level than perhaps is the inevitable thing that a couple of years down the line will be a review will actually move that specification up. Surely, if you have fairly regular reviews of, of specifications. The one danger you're going to get in terms of people coming into the market is if they feel that every three years, five years or whatever, the goalposts are simply going to get moved, mm -hmm. are, are they going to be in a situation where, well, if I'm investing a large amount of money in a taxi to try to think that, but then finding three years down the line it could be, the design could be redundant. You know, I, I think we're all presumably after the same thing of trying to get the maximum available uh, number of, of taxis of appropriate standard, let's put it that way, in the market. Surely the problem is that if you have, uh, certainly within a relatively short spaces of time, uh, periodic reviews on that sort of things, that will actually act as a disincentive for people to come into the market. It would be better to actually have a slightly higher standard at the start, well, there's then, then, then yeah. perhaps negate the need, at least in the short term, for there, there, reviews. There's different ways you, 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 can, you can handle that situation. You could look at age limits on fleets. You could restrict the age limit to 10 years. But at the same time, there must be some mechanism where as design moves on, and design is moving on. Mm -hmm. Each vehicle, for instance, London taxis have produced, has incrementally improved accessibility as they've gone along. So design does move on, but there must be some way of, of, of actually um, updating our regulations to make sure that we... we surely, we, surely better, though, at least then to start off on a, on a reasonable level, to start off with rather than a lower level, which is then inevitably going to be, have to be pushed up in a few years' time in that, in that regard. Again, that would to make, I, would, I, would, I would suggest maybe, again, the committee go back to the department and ask them for the implications of, say, enhancing the standards here. How many current commercially available accessible and or second-hand vehicles would be taken out of... And the, I, think, I think it's... Yeah. Okay, point sorry, in terms of Peter, I want to just welcome the students from Carrick Fergus College. And they are students for learning and for life and work. We are looking at a piece of regulation on uh, accessible taxis. So it's a very important issue, uh, particularly for the disabled users. Thank you. Okay, I'll uh, probably push that point as far as we can on that point. Just the other point I just want to raise uh, you've mentioned i mean i appreciate it as well i think you also make a very valid point which is that a lot of the issues around improvements in the wider sphere particularly when you're talking about outside of belfast are around issues which are not necessarily legislative in nature but it may be around training it may be around incentivizing which are not things you put down in sl1 but you know are, are policy issues of those largely in that part but specifically you'd, you'd highlighted concerns in relation to handrails and lighting i just wonder could you expand where you have, uh, where you see particular issues in, in relation to those? Well, it's it's very simple. It, it, they weren't included in in the uh, in the in the consultation. The, yeah, the I know, specification. Sorry, I would and say, they, would they say from be. a specification point of view, don't forget the committee are coming at this from an angle of we're not experts in the subject. So whenever you say yes, we can appreciate there was well, a look, recommendation. It, it wasn't, you know, from from a, what, from a point of view of, of wheelchair accessibility, handrail may not make a. 
uh, may not be the most important part of that, but for other users of the taxi, a handrail at the entrance and at strategic okay. points is, is crucial to people. In terms of the lighting it. issue, just June, June. <laughs> yes, certainly. Well, for visually impaired people and other people and a lot of older people whose sight are going down, it is so important to be able to orientate yourself within a taxi. And if you're coming from, you know, a, a, a light into darkness and, and so forth, and in the evenings, it's very reassuring to have that light there if you have some sight or, or failing sight. Um, and I think there's, a, there's an, from our committee's point of view, um, this was one of the things that we, we brought to the attention of ITP, that lighting in vehicles is very poor, um, and you're, you're sort of being, in some cases, manhandled, literally, into taxis um, if you've got a, a sight impairment or, or a vision loss. And again, it's about training, but it's also about putting that reassuring light there that we have in other vehicles and our own vehicles. I note one other final point, just which was, I think, raised um, by Disability Action. Obviously, the regulations are certainly permitting partitions, and I think there's, there's big advantages in having partitions in terms of uh, in terms of taxis. But obviously, allow where the uh, the regulations will allow sort of that there will be taxis without potentially partitions on it. One of the things I suppose we just would you welcome clarification on it? There's clear requirements in the regulations as regards intercom and loop systems where there are partitioned taxis, but it seems to be, and it may simply be a question of just getting that clarification on the position of um, intercom and loop systems where there isn't partition. Would you feel that would be something that also would be either necessary or would need clarification, or what are your views on, on the loop system in that regard? Well, an intercom, I mean, if there's going to be a partition, an intercom's vital. If anything yeah. happens to me in the back of that cab, how, how, I mean, how's the <coughs> on No, I understand that. I understand that that's in the regulations. But is there any? What will be the position where there isn't partition? Do you think there should be, particularly for those that, given the fact these are going to be wheelchair accessible, should there should that also extend to where there isn't partition? Well, the wheelchair taxis I use at the moment, they don't have a partition, no. and it's brilliant because it, you're just part of you're, you're normal. You're an average. Uh -huh person getting into a taxi, you're not disabled, you're not in a wheelchair. I'm f facing the front, I'm talking away to him, he's talking away to me if we need to. And I think the regulations need to be flexible. To, to, to take account of the, the different markets, you know, the rural service is a much more personal service. It is, you know, the, the taxi driver coming to your front door to pick you up. Um, the, you know, the discussion there was around, for instance, the, the rear, rear versus side loading. You need to have the flexibility for both, because in a rural area, you need yeah, no, rear I, loading. I think that's fair enough. What yeah. I suppose specifically was said, which is, I suppose, more of an urban type issue, mm. or certainly either an urban stroke town issue, is the issue on well, taxi you... taxi ranks side of it in terms of what uh, you know, in terms of the loading. A, taxi a wheelchair taxi doesn't go to a taxi rank. Well, they do in Belfast. But some of the ones in Belfast I can't get on. I can't get on them in the rank. Because yeah. if but he's in the middle, the rest of them have to move yeah. for me to get onto his. I suppose the issue, the issue was raised there was <clears throat> where you're getting uh, entry. If, if you take, for instance, the real situation where the vast bulk of, of journeys will be housed to, you know, and, and I think there's no problem in relation to that. And I don't think anybody would wish to restrict that. The issue is there's a, there is a safety issue around usage of rear loading in a taxi rank. I think that was the, the issue just that was raised. I, think I you don't like a rear loading taxi because literally you're from the road on and you're going back out backwards yeah, no, on the road. I understand that. So therefore, I, I, literally a side thing. Again, some of these elements you need the flexibility. Mm. I, I would, my position in that, and it, I don't mean this to sound cheeky in any way, but I would credit the taxi operator with, with a modicum of common sense and to buy a vehicle that suits what they want to use it for. If you're going to predominantly use ranks, a rear loading wheelchair accessible vehicle is impractical. Yeah, I think what yeah. possibly if I picked them up right from disability action, they were saying that there should be restriction around, around the loading bit at, at ranks because that, that is potentially dangerous in that regard where it isn't dangerous elsewhere. The, the, the difficulty, and again, just, just to expand that out a bit, the taxi operator will pick you up at your house, for instance, but you're yes. going somewhere in that taxi. So that might be into the nearest town to drop you off in the middle of town. So, in a sense, the, the rear loading will happen in towns as well as in the country. And to be honest with you, there's lots of people who, who drive, individuals who drive rear loading vehicles and go about town. So, you know, the, 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 the I think we're over, is, is overplaying there, perhaps the, 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 the. Yes, but I think. But that, that's slightly missing the point. What the point I think was made was that there isn't a problem per se with rear loading, and there shouldn't be a restriction on rear loading per se. On, 
but the issue of what restrictions, if any, apply around taxi ranks may have to be something that was looked at and factored in to any regulations on that, on that sort of Well, whether you can do that in regulations or whether it's an enforcement policy type issue, I'm not well, sure. I, I would have thought it shouldn't be too difficult to do it <coughs> in regulations, to be perfectly honest on it. Okay. Well, thank you very much uh, for your response. I think it is about a balancing act as well, yeah. and that you want to be as accessible as possible to wheelchair yeah. users, but you also have to think of the costs for the industry in adapting it and, and what's available in the market and what's cost effective for the taxi drivers. They are trying to make a living Mm -hmm. And if it is so prohibitive to get an, a, a disability accessible vehicle, then if it does not pay them, they, they will stop using it. They, they won't buy it. They won't operate. You know, one. Um, I have Alban here. Alban. Yeah, thank you very much, Chair. Uh, Alban McGuinness, uh, member of the committee. Uh, could I uh, thank you, first of all, for your presentation? Uh, it's been very, very useful, very helpful, and your written um, submission as well. Um, and I agree with the chair that the pragmatic approach that you've adopted is uh, seems to me to be a sound one, um, actively compromising between the high standards that you would desire, but given the marketplace and given the circumstances which people trade as taxi drivers. It's not necessarily uh, the, the standard that uh, would be achieved in any event, and also that the cost of that uh, would be excessive uh, for, for, for sole traders. Um, but there is an issue that was raised by disability action, and um, uh, the issue is of, of grandfather rights it seemed to me that the disability action were sympathetic to the idea of extending grandfather rights from five to seven years. Um, certainly that was uh, the, the suggestion that I picked up from the, the written submission that they made. Uh, would you be sympathetic to that or do you think that that's too long a period of time, uh, you know, given the fact that you're taking a pragmatic approach and people have to build up a certain amount of capital to reinvest in their vehicle and so forth. What, 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 how would you view that? I suppose you've summarised the point perfectly. We have been pragmatic in other, pragmatic in other regards and we do feel five, five years is long enough as grandfather rights and it's a point we made in the response to, to the consultation. Um, uh, Probably not much more you can no, okay. you can add to that really. No, um, not really. It's just um, where I'm coming from. The, the, tax, the disabled taxi I get for a powered wheelchair is actually what they call the party bus. In other words, it holds seven people. Hmm. So therefore, he's done me the service of getting in the ramp instead of the train tracks, which I fall off. And a friend who has six wheels can't get on. He has a flat ramp. So I mean, as far as I'm concerned, he's bent over backwards. To accommodate. Mm -hmm. Also, mm -hmm. it improves his earning capacity as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, um, I would think grandfather rights would be vital because it keeps him in business longer, no. which means that he is enough, God willing, enough custom and everything else to apply for a new taxi if yeah. required. But then again, you're also taking into consideration these aren't disabled taxis per se. Yes. Mm -hmm. This chap has actually uh, altered his seven seater. With the ramp, with the, the proper, um, what do you call those things that you put the ramp into? The mm. lockage, you, you know, the, the, where the, yes. the belts and everything else goes. Mm -hmm. So, therefore, he's accommodated uh, taking on disabled people. Sure. That's the fact the chap uh, that I'm spoke, speaking about in Bangor, um, he's actually went through the disability awareness training because he, he takes an awful lot of disabled, um, vulnerable adults and he knows how to interact with them. They feel comfortable with him, and it also improves his business. Right. So, therefore, I mean, improving a business and sort of grandfather rights, I think, is vital. I think as well that the regulations do allow for a taxi 
that was wheelchair accessible under the, the, the previous, uh, under the grandfather rights, to continue to operate as a taxi and to continue to carry wheelchair users. Mm -hmm. It just will not be recognised as a wheelchair accessible taxi. So the, the owners of older vehicles will still be able to operate them yes. and to carry wheelchair yes. users, just yeah. not be wheelchair accessible. Yeah. I think the, the points Vivian are making and the points we're making sort of highlights a sort of contradiction here. Yeah. Where, you know, we're saying on the one hand we want to extend the rights by seven years. On the other hand, can we not look at the regulations? What essentially will happen after the five years is those vehicles that don't meet the current specifications, which are predominantly very old vehicles, 25 years plus old vehicles at that stage, will be taken out of the system. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yep. Yes. Thank you very much, yes. Chair. And we want that improvement to take place as mm -hmm. soon as possible. Um, that, that's all the questions I have for you. Is everyone okay? Well, thank you very much indeed uh, for coming along. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, members, um, as I said before, um, the department would like us to proceed quickly, but I think we still have time, given the concerns uh, expressed today by Disability Action and Balance then by IMPAC. I think it's, it's, I think it's just useful if we ask the Department to come back yeah. next week yeah, and just to give us their view um, to see how the concerns by Disability, uh, disability Action uh, can be met. Um, okay, members, sure. Sure. Oh, wait, you agree with that? Yep, yep. Yep. Okay, thank you. Sorry, sir. Sure. Yes, say. Peter. Yeah. No, I, I think that's useful enough. I mean, I suppose yeah. just that there is a lot of the digestion there, whether yeah. next week or the first yeah. session well, after. Soon. It actually yeah. I wouldn't be just too doctrinaire in the timing, just enough. Sure. Yeah. As soon as possible, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, um, I think, I think that both sessions are very useful. Uh, for us to look uh, at the details. So we are on to correspondence item um, 10. Chair, yes, just yeah. the, the elections now, isn't it uh, coming up, you saying to bring them back next week? Yes, we <coughs> are still going to have a, a, a session next week. Yeah. That's the 30th of April. Mm -hmm. The only session we're not going to have is actually on the 7th, 7th, 7th of May. Okay. Mm -hmm. So um, maybe in the meantime, just, just to check members, we will be pressing yes. next week. We will have a quorum. Most people will be here next week. <laughs> we will have a quorum next week. Is mm, well. next week? <laughs> okay. No, okay. Don't, don't tell me a week is a long be. time in election time. It can't be guaranteed. <laughs> we have candidates here. Yes. Yeah. Can't be guaranteed. Right. Okay. Members, uh, item 10, correspondence. Uh, members, you have the list of correspondence on page 65. Um, just want to bring to your attention the Department's Biodegradable Carrier Bags Report. Uh, that's on the exemptions from the carrier bag levy, and that's at page 71, members. Uh, Pam, you may be particularly interested in this. The report conducted a review into how exemptions of the carrier bag levy on biodegradable grants might impact on several bag consumption and associated environmental, economic and consumer implications. The report concluded that an exemption on these grants would conflict with the overall policy objective of the carrier bag levy, and therefore biodegradability considerations should not be incorporated into the charging framework at this time. The Department will keep <coughs> this under review and it will be revisited in 2011 as part of a wider review uh, if well, carrier bag charging uh, w w about carrier bag charging arrangements. It's in, in the law, in the piece of legislation, to say that there will be a review then. Uh, you mean 2017, Chair, but I would welcome uh, the response. Be that. I yes. uh, we need the money common, too common for, for carrier bag levy. Yeah. <laughs> not enough to. Um, to see what comes of um, uh, that review in 2017. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, members. And also, then refer you to page 15 of tabled papers, uh, which is a notice from the department advising of the imminent publication of a consultation on the landscape character 
of Northern Ireland, which is being launched uh, on 24th of April 2015, and will run for six weeks. Uh, members, are you content to ask the Department to provide a synopsis of responses to the consultation when this becomes available? Great. I think that will be quite interesting. Consultation. Uh, members, then, are you content with the suggested actions uh, on the Kafanukt for correspondence? Content? Yeah. Thank you. Work forward programme is on page 109. Sorry, I mean, well, yes, forward work programme 109. Members, are you content to note that obviously mm -hmm. it will be filled up as time goes on? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, AOB? Any AOB no. members? No. So next meeting is a Saturday next week, Thursday, the 30th, same time, same place. Thank you very much. I can't believe it. We're finished so early. <laughs>